All right, well, um, welcome everybody to the November 2022 Interreach webinar. Um, we're very excited to have with us today, Melanie Bauer. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of an introduction, although she will have a great chance for us to hear more. Um, Melanie is a research development professional situated in a central research department at Nova Southeastern University in South Florida. Um, and in collaboration with a statewide research development network, she recently won $300,000 of NSF funding um, to develop a team science training program for faculty with her as a PI. Um, and this is working on youth inspired research targeted at intractable societal issues, which I know many of us are, are really in the midst of trying to solve ourselves. Um, and this is part of our continued series on boundary spanning with a uh, look at a spanning very specific boundaries, asking people to tell their stories. And particularly because Interreach is a community of people who are being the arrow in many, many different ways, um, playing many different roles. We thought that it was a fascinating story for Melanie to share with us how she and her team kind of span the boundary of um, different institutional habits in terms of who can be a PI, who can lead, and whose ex, uh, expertise is appropriate. Um, so what a cool success story, um, you know, spoiling by leading with that. It's such a success story that you uh, that you won this grant. And I think that a lot of people in this community were really interested in, in how you did that and how we can all learn from it. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Melanie, and at the end, we'll loop back and talk about how we might plan a reading and discussion club that will follow up on this. Um, so with that, thanks, Melanie, for joining, and the floor is yours. Well, wonderful. Let me get my screen sharing set up, and I should say um, I am more than happy and over would be overly excited to meet with anyone who wants to continue talking about how RD professionals or, or those related um, types of positions could find or what opportunities out there for are, are there for us to continue to lead. And so I'm, I'm open and ex would be excited about collaborations or if you just want to pick my brain and I can pick your brain about what you're thinking about things that that you could lead or, you know, staff members could lead in support of research. So um, as was said, um, I, I'm a research development professional, and this is a, a story actually using um, language that Christine um, helped to describe what we did, which is, you know, stepping outside institutional and also professional habit boundaries. So this is a story then about uh, research development professionals not staying in their lane. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know why those of us sort of flocked together and, and found each other, but um, I think, you know, there are lots of ways that, that we can connect maybe after this presentation by hearing this, or maybe you have um, local networks that you can connect to people who, again, can continue to support you if you're interested in, in doing something similar to, to what we did. Um, this is also a story, I guess, by nature of not staying in your lane, of, of being boat rockers. Um, I remember one time I was at um, a, a Nordup event and individuals on the call said, you know, in general, we tend to be people who aren't boat rockers. We're really service minded. We're, we're there to, to support people and, and to, to help them do what they want to do. And I, and I said, wait, wait, this is why I'm different. I'm not that. I, I mean, I am a boat rocker. That That is what I do. Um, and so I don't know, it was a bit of an epiphany, a, a better understanding of, of maybe who am I and how I fit or don't fit or what leads me to do the things that I do. So anyway, we, we have a story of people not staying in their lane and maybe being boat rockers. And so Christine introduced myself, but um, just to, I can't remember all the details that she shared, but I am in a central research department, just one of those offices of one. Um, my institution is an R2 university. Um, we're private. Uh, we do lots of medical professional training. So I would say we're still quite research emerging, despite having that high research activity designation. 
And um, our institution, as, as well as myself, and sort of maybe our department, has aspirations of, of grandeur. And I, and I hope they're not delusions. Well, I mean, we had this success that I'm here to share with you about today. Um, but, but, but really, it, I'm in, I feel very much in a space that's very supportive, that's open to new ideas, and, and really is looking to see where we can break through. So before joining this position, I've, I've been in it now for two years. I, this is my first research development position. Um, but before coming here, I was situated in a research lab. It was an education research lab. We also did program evaluation. Um, we primarily studied undergraduate STEM teaching and learning. And if you're a program evaluator, you sort of know this work, which is building a lot of logic models, pathway models, these kind of things, which, by the way, have served me quite well in an RD position, being able to um, support faculty to write, you know, the, the evaluation sections of their program proposals. But just a little more about this lab. We had um, most of our funding from NSF, so I wrote a lot of NSF grants that certainly did me well. And in, in I, uh, I I have to think, um, you know, of course, applying for to get this project funded. We also had some support from HHMI and NIH to do sort of program evaluation type work. <clears throat> So for this evaluation, um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to place them in the chat or else definitely we will talk at the end of these slides um, as well. So who I'm working with now <clears throat> is this network um, of research development professionals down here in Florida. Uh, right now we have 21 higher ed institutions who are part of this network. We're basically a state version of NORDA um, and we, oh, well, just by the way, uh, we're the Florida Research Development Alliance. And that leads me to continuing to fill out what this is a story about, um, you know, being those boat rockers and going outside of our lanes. You know, we were maybe kind of naive, but really brave. I mean, we, we said, you know, wouldn't it be nice if us as a network of 21, 22 higher ed institutions had a little bit of money to do something? You know, we were coming back from the, the pandemic and we're like, you know, in-person events, okay, when you have one of those, you need a good bit of money. Let's see what we can do in the realm of something to support faculty and we're probably gonna need a little money to do it. So this network, um, a subset of us got together, five institutions, various institutional contexts um, scattered across Florida. And we said, you know, what if we came together and, and wrote a grant? Um, by the way, a subset of the individuals I partnered with from each of these institutions, we also serve as the executive committee for this statewide RD Alliance. So specifically to give credit where credit is due, this is my team. Um, we work together to submit this grant and now um, have been implementing it um, since May. Uh, so this is a two year grant and I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but uh, this is us, this is us working together. We have various, mostly RD roles, though some of us also do research administration. One of us is a faculty member and um, yeah, we. We're all in that sort of general professional space. So this, just to give you a little background on our alliance, if you're curious, um, it's six years old, uh, this statewide one. We have monthly virtual meetings. So these are research development plus, I should say. There's there's some people who are 100% RD, like myself. There are some people who actually are 100% research administration and don't yet have RD responsibilities, but, but find um, value in connecting with um, RA and RD people around the state. So anyway, we meet virtually about once a month. We share on best practices. We do similar, we have similar types of conversations that maybe Nordup type webinars or PMGs are having, are having but um, we do this um, amongst our members here in Florida. We also uh, meet twice annually in person. And so far we've done one statewide faculty networking event. The whole purpose of this alliance was to unite um, RD people for the purposes of supporting and facilitating faculty collaborations across our institutions. So it's taken a little while, but we, we finally had our first statewide event um, this year, I believe it was earlier in the spring. And um, that was really exciting seeing faculty, it was a virtual event, um, come together and do sort of a speed networking type scenario. And then we got this grant. So in case you're interested, this is was funded through the NSF germination program. It's through their um, uh, 
Directorate for Engineering, and but it's their multi multidisciplinary programs division, and they were they give funding still do for developing support for researchers across the career stages uh -huh. to um to 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 help develop them so that they can germinate, create innovative research questions. So if you're interested, this is an opportunity maybe to, to support some of the work that you're doing. So in that same realm of being somewhat naive but brave, we, we took that leap of faith and we said, hey, or we, we put in the effort to, to write this grant. By the way, it was only a six-page grant that had a pre-proposal stage. So it was nice little um, baby steps into, into this world and, and, and not having to write, you know, like a 15 page or anything like that. And so it, it really panned out. It typically this, um, this program, it looked like they'd give hundred thousand dollar grants to start. So that's what we submitted with. We had the really unexpected fortune, the sort of thing that never happens where the program officer came back to us and said, can we give you $300,000 instead of 100? And we were just blown away and said, of course you can. And so that allowed us to extend from what we had planned as a one-year budget to two. It allowed us to buy out some more of our effort. We had, I can't remember if we had no effort across the board or just minuscule effort, but we really beefed that out. We bought us ourselves some time to develop, um, to disseminate the findings of this in year two and really develop products that'll be usable, hopefully for all of us in, in doing related work. And so look at that, being somewhat naive, but brave really paid off in this scenario. And so, and so our project was born. So we um, gave uh, our program an overarching topic of Florida coastal challenges. So we figured, you know, what's a topic that really um, is signature to our state, but also could touch on a number of disciplines. And we came up with coastal challenges. And this is like our, a snapshot of our marketing page. So we marketed it to faculty researchers across Florida who had interested interest in getting some team science training and a practical experience. So the, the goals for this program then was to help them better understand the coastal challenges happening. And I'll tell you a little bit about ultimately the, the program components that helped us deliver on these, but just an overview of the goals. So people becoming more aware of the challenges across our state, getting some skills and experience in, in their team science toolkit. So they have, you know, the, the, some, some, you know, understandings and knowledge and appreciation for what happens here. Um, helping them to expand their researcher network so they, they, they were going to have the opportunity to meet faculty from across the state and then get some support as us RD people do in helping faculty to create some type of research product. It could be a grant, but or some one of our groups I think is interested in like a review article. Another one is interested in, a, in creating a a, a, like more of like a tool product. And so these were our goals and they're accomplished in two stages. Um, one that we've already completed, which happened in August, we were able to do a three-day in-person event where they got um, some training in team science, which I'll tell you just briefly about. And it was, it was about getting this cohort of faculty members to get to pitch and get excited about ideas and then form teams. So this became really um, the major goals to accomplish this project and ideation and teaming event. So get our faculty members into teams so they could move on to the next stage, which we're right in the middle of right now, our idea sprint, which is virtual. So we're supporting um, each of these teams to continue developing their idea and moving closer toward uh, some type of research product. So each of us who you saw on the prior screen across the top, all of our headshots, each of us is supporting a team. So we're getting ourselves experience in team science. I'll speak for myself and say I had almost no experience in this before. So not only were the faculty learning a lot at our research summit, um, but I was learning a lot and I'm learning a lot now in this practical experience. So some other details about our program. If you're curious about our faculty, so we broadcast this across all of our member institutions here in Florida. We ended up with 56 applications of which 54 ended up being eligible. We accepted 20 and 16 ended up showing up at our event. So they are our participants in the program and they are um, organized into four teams. And so, as I said before, each is now being led by a research development coach. 
So they're getting coached to continue developing their idea and their product. Some other details on the grant, I think I said this before, but we have effort on the grant as PIs and co-Is. All of our institutions were very supportive in having a chunk of the grant funding come, of course, to their institution. And um, it did require us speaking with our supervisors, um, but they all were supportive of us um, devoting some of our effort to this grant. A subset of us on this grant are part of a research team. So we have goals to you know, publish in, in this area based on what findings we have and to hopefully create some useful tools and other types of products for RD and other um, professions. And we ourselves are developing to be better team science facilitators. Here's a photo of all of us at our in-person research summit event. So not only us as facilitators, but our faculty um, participants. A little bit more about our faculty, if you're curious. Um, I'm always interested to know, you know who signs up for these types of programs. Um, by design, um, we ended up with about half being assistant professors in our application or application acceptance stage. We gave weights to certain groups of people to hopefully get them especially um, trained and accepted into this program to get this type of experience. So I should say we designed for this a little bit, but half, uh, about half are the early career. I guess not surprisingly, um, almost all of them had had some type of experience in interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary projects. About half had already led them and half had only participated in them and only two had no experience at all. And I should say these numbers don't align with 16 because I forgot to redo these slides since, um, since we had uh, a few dropouts. And then here shows the types of institutions that they have that they these faculty members come from. And here again, they don't add up to 16 because some institutions are also uh, um, double have, have multiple uh, characteristics. So um, we did end up with what we hoped, which was a, a, a decent um, spread across different institutional types. Though um, not surprisingly, the more research intensive universities. Um, had faculty who were interested. All right, so then, you know, I've said this before, but now let me say it in terms of this webinar series that, that this um, presentation is a part of, which is that we are serving as boundary spanners here. We, you know, RD people are already boundary spanners. And in relation to this um, network in particular, we're really leveraging, and the whole purpose of this alliance is to connect you know, to be a network of networks, to be a group of individuals who have local capacity that's maybe shared with other institutions or, um, you know, what can we collectively do um, that's greater than the, the sort of sum of our parts. And um, this definitely is a story of us, you know, going outside what our institutions are used to having RD people do, you know, serving as a PI and co-PIs on a grant, and, and also what, what our profession, which I most identify with this NORDF organization. Really, the topics talked about and the type of people there are, are the is the type of role that I'm serving here at my campus. And I guess I I, I do actually think another um, NORDF member won a germination grant this past year as well. But it's not a topic I hear talked about really at all in the sessions that I've been in. Just this ability that we that we have, and, or this untapped energy or opportunity to for us to serve um, as PIs and co-PIs and, and the leaders on grants. So really, I think this, at least at, at this this state level, but who knows, maybe um, at the national level and beyond too. You know what we're doing now. Um, it's going to be different than what we do a few years from now, especially in reference to the statewide organization. We're at a time six years old now. We don't yet have a strategic plan. We're getting input now from members about what value they see in the statewide network. What, um, what are we uniquely positioned to do and, and where might we go in the next five to 10 years? So I think what we do at the state level um, might be a real opportunity to push the boundaries of research development. Um, so uh, we're, we're excited for it. And actually at the end of this talk, I would be interested in some of your thoughts about how we can stretch um, what research development professionals and other related professions do. 
So just to backtrack a little bit to give you an idea of what we did at our research summit um, event, uh, here's just a photograph of me with my team who I'm now leading in our virtual um, idea sprint. Uh, but this is when we were meeting in person here in South Florida. This event, so the, the, the training that happened um, was as follows. Uh, we had stakeholders come, so individuals working in like government or um, uh, private foundations that are relate that that deal with Florida coastal challenges in their daily work. We had them come and present. We also had a few funders come and present. So individuals at the state or federal level who give money to address Florida coastal challenges. We also had a number of experts, maybe some are on the call. I didn't look at the whole participant list, but um, definitely ones that names that you know in, in this area of team science come and talk about the major topics in team science, like trust and shared leadership, and other things that are relevant for us in particular, being mostly virtual for the duration of this program. You know, what, what tools can we use and, and how do we continually stay engaged in the virtual environment? So this is this is the trainings we've got at the summit. We in the mornings and then the afternoons, the teams would meet. Um, amongst themselves and continue to develop an idea. On the last day, they gave pitches. So each um, team had seven minutes to pitch their idea. We put a lot of pressure on them, I should say, just by having this pitch. We didn't put pressure on them. Um, but it, it was a nice way to end this three-day ideation and teaming um, event to, to have them pitch sort of what they where their thoughts were at the end of these three days with an idea. And, and they really stepped up and it was really exciting. So as I mentioned before, we have the, the individuals who are planning and facilitating this event and a subset of us are on the research team. So we are interested in getting what we learn really out there. And so I thought I'd present some, some research questions that we're generally interested in exploring. We certainly don't have the answers to these at this time, but just to show you in the realm of, of what we're thinking is, um, especially in relation to this NSF germination grant program, they're interested in, and then so are we, in how does team science enhance innovation? And in particular, in for the purposes of our program, in the realm of complex societal challenges, in teams that are geographically dispersed, virtual, those are who are from diverse institutional contexts, and okay, I guess I put virtual here at the bottom. So our research question, though general, has some special flavor with the program that we are tapped into. Um, how do untapped RD resources support team formation and development? And so, again, thinking about RD and how it can or is currently supporting in these four areas uh, along the right hand side here. So, um, what, how do you do that when people are all around the state only meeting every other week for an hour? How do you keep the momentum going in, in early stage teams and then as they continue to develop? What are the unique obstacles and opportunities that exist in the geographically dispersed virtual diverse institution and complex societal challenges space? And some additional questions here at the end. Um, you know, what leads to notable creativity, productivity, success? I'm not saying we're going to have a, a final answer to this at the end, but we do have four case studies that are going to be interesting to track and follow and try to identify what did the coach do? What did the faculty members do? What about the training really helped to lead to a very successful, creative, productive team? And then really in our year two, focusing on what parts of this program really worked, which what should we share with others? How could it be scaled? Um, and yeah, so this is these are some of the questions we're interested in investigating through this program and hope to be able to share out maybe at an upcoming NordUp conference or through some other um, uh, venue so, so that others can hear about um, what worked and what didn't for us. And this is, is, is absolutely a story. If I didn't say it explicitly, let me say it now, where we're keeping our sights not only on developing our faculty researchers, but also us as RD staff. And I don't know if that's unique. Um, I, I, it's hard to sometimes get a sense through Project Abstract if the other NSF germination um, projects or, or other similar programs that are faculty development programs, are they also thinking about how can we train our RD staff or you know what, what would we then bring next 
and try to share out to our field about, okay, we learned, this is what we learned about facilitating teams or supporting teams, but this is definitely central to our program. And so far, what we learned through this program is there are really moments of ease that happened, I'll say early on, and now we're really in the challenge phase. Um, team science has really been an iceberg um, scenario for myself and I think our team, which is, you know, before you really get into it, you see that surface level and you're like, okay, I think I know what I'm getting myself into. And then once you really get into it, there, there are unexpected challenges. So I'll share a few of the moments of ease and challenge and maybe some of these will resonate with you or you can think of ways to overcome them. But, you know, the ease was kind of surprising um, given that we were ge we are geographically dispersed, even as the, the program team. So you saw we're, we're from five institutions around the state. We don't see each other except by scheduling Zoom meetings. So that was challenging. Um, that could have been challenging for us. But actually, um, at both the writing the NSF grant phase, as well as planning our that three day research summit event for faculty, it was actually not too difficult. Um, we had meetings that we really organized by having jam boards set up ahead of time. So every meeting had a series of jam boards or actually I queued up a bunch of jam boards. I knew there were a series of topics I wanted to cover um, to help us plan for that big in-person event. And so we worked our way through them. And I, I, I'm sure many on the call use jam board, but I'll just say this was a real helpful tool in, in keeping a team who's planning an in-person event together, but, it, but who are um, dispersed all around the state to, to get the things done and to talk about the things that need to be talked about. So these two steps of the project, so we pre-project, writing the NSF grant, and then planning our first event were actually not too difficult. What has been a greater challenge, you're not gonna be surprised, is, is doing this doing um, this program in a geographically dispersed, virtual, diverse institutional context while coaching faculty teams. So we've now added not only our, our five program um, facilitators, but now we're working in a space where faculty members have varying priorities, um, various institutional commitments and responsibilities. And so this has been harder. And just an example of this is, this is sort of my blurred out schedule, but this kind of represents every faculty member schedule, which is totally booked. And in fact, we found the only time we could meet was 8 a.m. on a Thursday, which for our person in the panhandle was 7 a.m. So I, it was, it's was it been something to learn that when you open up a program to a whole state's faculty members, you're going to get participants who have heavy teaching loads and who have to really squeeze this in or work outside their typical schedule to get it done. So this really just schedule this step really made me appreciate um, just the additional supports that are needed or, or affordances that are needed in a program working with uh, such a diverse faculty group. So some of the boundary spanning or other boundary spanning that this uh, program team is doing is we presented at the 2022 um, International Network for Science and Team Science Conference. Um, so if you're familiar with insights, we we definitely, of course, resonate with that team science approach there. We are now here presenting to this group, and I, I need to stay plugged in and, and continue to, to monitor the conversations happening here because, you know, Look, the conversation, these similar conversations are likely happening, as you all probably know, across many organizations, all with a slightly different group of stakeholders and topics or approaches to talking about topics. Um, uh, so, you know, it's something to keep in mind that if you're if you're not yet part of some of these other organizations, there might be similar conversations happening and tools or approaches that you might not know about that might be used. And we do have future plans to scale this program, um, definitely through our state, maybe hopefully through NORDUP or, or other types of uh, networks of faculty members. So these are just some of the, the connections that um, we can make in terms of our program topic. And my colleague on this project, Steve Fiore, pointed out this article um, to us. And so um, I'm now sh showing it to you, which is, if you if you didn't already see it, this um, article in Nature in their Humanities and Social Science Communications um, section on this, this integration expert. So you might all be nodding your head, I can't see, but uh, um, 
you know, this is a, a relatively new profession and, you know, it might call for establishing uh, a new academic career. People who lead, administer, manage, and so on um, interdisciplinary projects or programs. It, this, is, this is you all, I, I'm sure. And, um, but maybe we might start seeing institutions, higher ed institutions creating um, the position titles that aren't just research development professional or research administrator, but are in these, these are probably already existing in things like centers and institutes, but I wonder, it'll be interesting to see just where this this takes off too, and if we have a new professional society or, or what comes next. But I'll say what, what I've liked working with other RD people on for this project is that, you know, we're really practical about it. Um, we, we're supporting faculty members every day, so we want to know what works and what doesn't. You know, we've developed a fairly expensive um, program, but you know, we're going to definitely be thinking about how can we do this for cheap or for free or especially when we think about scaling this around our state. It's definitely not something we're going to be able to constantly get grant funding for. So so what are the pieces that are really practical to take away for a single team or for catalyzing multiple teams? You know, of course, a benefit to working with RD people on this also is because we work directly with faculty as you all probably know, but we're also connected by nature of just being in higher ed institutions, or maybe our offices have these connections as well to communities outside of our, um, off our campuses that, that can really be leveraged. And I'll say, you know, shout out to all my offices of one out there, but I, I feel a, a large amount of job freedom and support to be really like entrepreneurial, go after, you know, certainly working with faculties and teams, but also with addition, developing additional programs and, and whatnot um, to, to, to do this type of work, to, to, to do things um, a little beyond. And I've heard similar things echoed from my Nordup colleagues that, you know, in this office of one, sometimes institutions create an RD position and don't yet know what to do with it. And so when you're hired, you can be really opportunistic and see what you can go after. So um, this is what I've really liked about working with RD people on this type of a program. And by the way, um, I found real benefits to being a PI on a federal grant. So certainly in the grant application stage, I was, you know, acting as a faculty member using our sponsored program officer resources and support. Um, also have since had to learn a lot of university systems, software about offices I never knew existed. So you really get an insight. You get, you get to, to witness the faculty side of things for once, right? And um, you just get a greater understanding of and appreciation for how this all works. And of course, uh, you know, as a PI, you get you get to brag about it. You get to to say it when you give faculty um, presentations that that I do know this space. And look, because you know, I know NSF. I've, I I have experience with this. I know a little bit more about this than you might think I do. Or and so self promotion of faculty. Um, it can also help your institution get future grants. I'm I'm now thinking about the next grant that I'm going to write. I might not be the PI. I might be the co PI. But hey, then that'll help my institution get. Um, uh, potentially another NSF grant, because now we have a track record. I should say we, we get almost no NSF grant. So just this one has been really important for our institution. Um, I've learned a lot. So I, I don't have a, a ton of opportunity to support teams here. We don't have a ton of research activity. Those who do research do it really well and, and don't ask for my help. Um, so, but how do I really support those who are new and early stage and, and get a little more experience in this before I do it here at my institution? Um, that has really helped me. And, and, and frankly, I, I also got a financial bump from getting a, becoming a PI. Fortunately, I have a, a very um, uh, supportive supervisor who recognized this achievement and was able to reward it. And that, that feels really good, of course, personally, but also professionally. So this, this was, it was an unexpected benefit. I, I didn't think it at all going into it. And something else that my, fact, that my institution does, and I don't know how common this is, but um, a portion of indirects, um, 
I think it's uh, cost recovery or FNA recovery, faculty members, I thought it was only faculty, but I come to learn it staff too, that when you get a grant, um, a portion of our approximately 50% in indirects is given back to the faculty members. So at my institution, this is quite high because we're research emerging, we get 20% back as a PI on a, on, of the indirect costs. I've heard others that are maybe like five or 10%, but this is a real bonus. I now have a research account where, that I can use for my own professional development. So I can go to a Nordup conference. I can go to Science of Team Science conference. And that has been another unexpected thing. And, and should you also have interest in, you know, scholarship and publishing, of course, you know, if you have a program that you get to collect data on, then you can publish about it. So that's been that's been a, some expected and some unexpected benefits to being a, a PI. So I'd like to pause now and, and see if you have any questions about this program. And then I do have a few questions for you as well, but I thought maybe I'd stop for just a moment and um, see if there were questions. Thank you so much for uh, such a, a well put together talk. And I love the arc of the story that you had in there, Melanie. Um, would love to um, open it up for as many people as would like to, to pose some questions before Melanie um, poses hers. It's always hard to be the first one. So I, I have one on deck. So you mentioned partway through, um, it was when you had the pie graphs of uh, all the different participants and you said that there had been attrition um, four people dropped out, which I think we always expect. But I was curious if you saw any patterns of who it was that was having um, to drop out and maybe whether what that says about their ability to be a uh, part of it, where what their background story is. Yes, and in all four of those cases, or, or at least three of them, they had medical emergencies come up, either their personal ones or family members. One was in the hospital with COVID, in fact, um, so it was unfortunate, but we, we did require it as a, a step so people couldn't join after. We really thought that three-day intensive experience could not be replicated or caught up on after, so I, I will just say that. Otherwise, um, we'll probably have learnings come the end of the program about more around engagement and and what, um, not what types of faculty members, but what led certain team members to be more or less engaged or what created the conditions for a very engaged team. So I'd say we don't have any learnings now about participation, but I think later we'll have those around engagement and success. Great, thank you. Hi, Melanie, great presentation. This is Caitlin talking. Um, in one of your slides, you mentioned that you guys are working to or developing to be more adept team science facilitators. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that or what you're doing or how you're doing that. Right. So um, our first step in that was really that three day in person research summit event where every morning from basically nine to noon, we heard um we witnessed or we participated in workshops just like the faculty did. So if they had, um, we had one presentation around, well, um, shared leadership and, and virtual engagement of teams. We were right there with the faculty member. Okay, how do we do this? How do we share leadership here so everyone feels that they're contributing and they're engaged? And how do we do this virtually when we're only going to be meeting um, occasionally um, after having been in person for three days? We also um, heard um, topics on certainly trust that we know. Um, we really relied on our four experts that we, we invited to give the presentations to cover what they thought we needed to know. We didn't suppose to know other than to tell them the nature of our program and say, you know, what do we need to know? And um, so I guess those are some of the topics that we covered. Um, also, you know, things, uh, Steve Fiore covered things about, you um, you know, active listening and super tuning, if you've ever heard these types of things. So how to talk across disciplinary lines, like how to not talk too jargony, how to be clear in what you're saying, how to ask questions to, to get toward more clarity around a topic. There were just simple tools that Bethany Larson equipped us with, which was um, taking a quick temperature read in a team, just doing a quick thumbs up, thumbs down or middle has been the most useful thing we learned in person and during virtual engagement where you just quickly, it's not, it's it, a nodding head is kind of 
people can nod really emphatically or not. You really don't get a read. Is everyone on board to move forward? And so it's really been helpful, again, in person and virtual, to have every team member say, are you thumbs up? Are you still unsure? Or are you really not like in the direction we're going on a certain thing? And so that's been really helpful. And then our final presenter, just since I've, I've named, or a couple more, since I've named them, we also had um, Michelle Bennett, who's the science of team science, or no, sorry, team science field guide, one of the authors, and then also Marissa Shuffler. Um, so those were our experts that we invited and they crafted 90 minute workshops for us that had both um, content as well as some uh, interactive activities to, to, in, um, to, to help us better understand how to support team science. And since now that we're in the virtual stage, we meet monthly with Steve Fiore. He's a co-PI on the grant. He's the past president of the International Science of Team Science. So he's a faculty researcher who studies team science and has been publishing for, for quite some time. And so he's our re real resident expert team scientist. And he gives us monthly, we are collecting faculty survey. So we're, we're collecting information from faculty in terms of how they think their team is going and so on. We have a, a, a number of items. And then he looks at that data and gives us a monthly progress. Well, we get the progress report and then he gives us a monthly mini training. So he'll say, hey, this is what I'm seeing in the faculty members, you know, in their responses. Here might be something you some things you should keep in mind now at this stage in the program. So we're continuing to get little bits of professional development through one hour monthly check-ins with this team science expert. Wow, that's awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. So a question in the chat is if individuals participating, so if our faculty knew each other before the meeting, not at all. Um, they didn't know anyone. I think um, we purposely, this was another by design um, scenario. We wanted for every institution that applied, so if they had one faculty member apply or 10, we wanted to prioritize getting at least one faculty member from that institution. So the power of our statewide network is having as many institutions connected as possible. So for our first major program that we were running, we wanted that to be almost top priority, like barring ineligibility due to other reasons, we designed for that. So what happened was that only really one person came from in each institution, and in a couple of cases, there were two. So I think in one case, two people knew each other, but they're not working on the same team. So no one on a team knows each knew each other before, and almost no one knew each other at all in the program. Let's see, if Jeremy. Yeah. Hi, Melanie. Thank you for this overview. Um, I'm wondering how you defined success for the proposal? You know, is it really like the out, outputs from the teams uh, or is it like the, uh, you know, the sort of study of how everything went down as the outputs or both? Um, and then a sort of a follow-up question is then how did, how did those decisions feed into uh, how you wrote about the broader impacts? Yeah. So, oh, I'd have to return to our proposal to, to actually remind myself what, what we put in the broader impacts, but I'll say, you no, know, we of course developed a logic model for this grant with a set of clear objectives and the, the faculty objectives around, we had, we had outcomes primarily for faculty, but also for RD professionals and also for other stakeholders, but the other stakeholders was a weaker set of objectives. But I'll say for our faculty members, it was, very much in line with the germination program, the NSF germination program, what they want, which is interest in interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary projects and generation of innovative research questions. So minimally, that is what we need in order to be able to say to NSF, we had a success. These other things that we've tacked on, like developing research team science facilitators um, is bonus, I think. Um, I mean, it is something we committed to in the grant, but um, that is success then is also similar types of things for us in RD. We feel we're interested in supporting interdisciplinary projects. We feel we have facility to do that. We have the tools that we need to do that. So it's, it, it is an early stage program types of goals, like interest, um, feel prepared for, um, but are we, it, other than that research question, as far as performance and behavior, it's it's really more at the um, interest stage, interest, openness, 
attitudes kind of a thing. And we do have a second year on the program, so we might be able to monitor a little bit more like where these faculty teams end up. Um, but we have not promised that they're going to be productive teams or even stay together after our grant. But so hopefully that gives you an idea. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, I'm going to jump into my questions for you, but I'm happy to go back and forth. Um, I had I had some questions um, just in the sort of visioning space. Uh, just have a few questions, so I'm just going to present them and, and feel free to share your thoughts on, on any of them through chat or through unmuting. But, you know, what can research development or related professions, if you're not an RD, that means you, um, do that you're not already doing? What do you want to do? Um, maybe in thinking about that, you know, what are you particularly suited to do or situated based on prior experience or based on the institutional context in which you're in? Um, so, so think about that. And then what are some of the ways that you'll struggle? I mean, early on for us, we weren't sure if all of our departments would allow us to devote effort. I'm 15% effort on this grant. Um, the other faculty, sorry, the other staff members are between five and 8% on this grant for two years. So um, we didn't know if they'd if we'd all get the green light for that, but we did. So that was great. Um, that was a way we could have struggled. Um, but, uh, you know, and or what do you need then to overcome those obstacles? Or what do you need to succeed? So be interested in some of your thoughts in this, either you personally or RD, generally speaking. I know people don't want to jump in, um, especially if they're, some people have screens off to eat lunch, depending on where they are. Um, <clears throat> I really liked the how you started with just introducing and inviting boat rocking and getting out of lanes. Um, and I think that maybe leaning into that possibility that there are, uh, particular areas that you are more suited to win, uh, like in a faculty training grant, for example, than somebody who is actually doing the faculty role already themselves. So, I mean, I think even just naming the fact that there are arenas where research development professionals can be the most well-suited to lead, um, and then looking for things that fall in that bucket could be something that I, I don't believe a lot of places that I've seen do that. Um, and then the only other piece I was gonna add in and Anne alluded to this, um, well, just by saying go evaluation is that I, I wonder how much you see overlap in the possibility of evaluators dipping into research um, because I've learned through some of these projects that things I thought the evaluators would do they're, they can't do in their evaluation role because they have to rely on evidence-based metrics. And that is different than generating the evidence base sometimes, right? So like how, how could evaluators join in with research development professionals also seen sometimes outside the faculty PI lead role, but actually with, they're the ones that have the expertise to drive, I think, these big complex convergence efforts. Um, so I guess naming that bucket and then inviting evaluators are my sort of my two ideas. I wonder if others have comments. And that's interesting because I've, you know, I've heard conversation maybe in this similar realm of, or a question of are funders open to writing into like center proposals or large faculty team proposals facilitators, like people who are dedicated to doing sort of what we're doing in this program to help move a large team along through a set of goals. But interesting, you say evaluators, evaluation, because that's a staple on program grants. I don't think as much a staple on research grants, but maybe that would be the way to back into it, is to have a research development professional or an RD person partner with an evaluator and call it, they're doing evaluation. Um, and oh, that's interesting. And so I see a comment in the chat too. 
to GIA. So maybe we can get already people written in to do evaluation, to su support evaluation plus. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought about that in the evaluation realm. Hi, Melanie, this is Leah. Um, I would turn on my camera, but I'm having some Zoom problems today. Um, so I think I think the context that you're doing this is really interesting um, because um, I think that this, uh, in my institution, the question of like, what can we do to support research development professionals and improving skills in leading this kind of project is not something that is nearly as prioritized as what can we do to improve faculty skills in leading in these projects. But the nice thing about team science framework is you're having those conversations about shared le leadership. You're having conversations about how hierarchy affects teams. And so it's an interesting place to, um, to um, start having these conversations. So, um, I'm, I, it, I'm definitely going to give it some thought to how we might leverage that for our, for our institution or for our state as well. Yeah, and that's like what you said sort of at the end. That's we're plugging into a network. You can make the case a little bit more for, well, certainly asking for money, um, but to thinking about building something with impact. Um, yeah. Oh, Laura, you're oh. unmuted. Yeah. I can't hear you. We can't hear you, Laura. Dang it. <laughs> now? Yes. Yeah. Yay. Okay, um, I enjoyed thinking about what you learned serving as a PI, like as far as OSP and all the yeah. logistics and administrative. Um, and then I also was just having an interesting conversation with my husband last night, who is faculty in attending that NSF rotator officer uh, talk yesterday about how, you know, they're so interested in diversity and they do say in the call, like research development people could be considered, but then, you know, they're really like, oh, we want tenure track. And I thought it was like, really, I was arguing to Robert, like research development people see like such a breadth of like NSF applications of all applications. And like, we have such a diverse skill set that it would make a lot of sense for me to consider an RD person as a program officer. And he was arguing, well, you know, you need to have the research and um, proposal app, um, div, um, the project management end of it. And so we had an interesting discussion that this is kind of bringing up. <laughs> yes, it is a goal for my myself to get on a review panel, hopefully over the next year. And not that you have to have a grant to get on a review panel, but it's, it's one way maybe if you're not a faculty researcher to get on a, a panel. But it, I think for these program grants that are about developing faculty development programs, I mean, who who better to serve? I don't know if they have rotators in, in this one. I don't actually don't know at what level rotators work. If, if, if some directorates or divisions are too small to even have rotators, I'm not sure. I didn't attend that talk, but but maybe even short of a rotator, if some of us could get on review panels and just learn a lot, like we tell our faculty how much they would learn. Um, that might be attainable. That's a good idea. And NSF germination, by the way, is one of those that would really work. I'm I'm also looking at a couple of other NSF grants. That's one I'm I'm probably going to stay in my lane on. Like I I I figured out NSF. I think so. I think I'll probably stick there. But um, the NSF I use program, so the improving undergraduate STEM education. I think there's real opportunity even though it's focused on undergrads, that, that someone will maybe at a small institution or there's a possibility that, that my department and, and or me will be supporting our Office of Undergraduate Research. And so if you happen to have those that type of role that could potentially be more broad, that could be a type of opportunity um, for you to write something as well as the NSF includes, which is in the graduate education space. And sort of similarly, my department and sort of me 
as well is going to be probably part of growing graduate PhD programs around the university. So that I think would be another opportunity to serve as a probably not a PI in either of these cases, but a co-PI and really help develop things that we're good at, like programming will certainly help with the proposal, but then, you know, programming. And if you have that evaluation expertise um, and just being someone who builds research resources for a university, those are a couple other opportunities, maybe. I love it. Especially the HSI version of the I use if you're at an HSI. I mean, just your encyclopedic knowledge of the programs, it, it kind of made me think of, you know, it it sounds like veering out of your lane when you think of the lanes as being named based on title, but it's actually just that the lanes were named wrong because they're, if, it's a, if you think of it as they're, it's about expertise, you have the abs, like the objectively right expertise to have the vantage point over what you're talking about. So I think just training ourselves to think about the expertise as the defining factor of what you can contribute and not uh, something that turns out to be relatively arbitrary, like a title, um, uh, then there's a lot of opportunity for all of us. And then convincing a funder. We weren't sure how hard that would be, but it wasn't, I, I mean, I don't know if it was hard or not. I mean, we had RD people plus a faculty expert who's really expert in this area. He happens to be at a Florida institution. So we really lucked out with that. Um, so yeah, that was that first step. And then, you know, these, they might be more open than, than maybe we would expect these federal agencies to not, to having non-faculty PIs. Um, but who, I don't know if it's a one-off. This is the only one I've tried. <laughs> That's so great. Well, it's um, a great inspiration um, and fantastic. When we put together Interreach as a community, we all assembled coming from very different roles, but all of us with this idea that there should be a way to grow up to be this connector as a career on purpose. And so, um, I don't know, I love hearing the example of how you saw what needed to be done, saw that you could and went for it and got it. So. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I know we're at the top of the hour and we'll we'll get back together um, for anybody who has uh, is, typically we do it the fourth week of the month for a follow up kind of reading and discussion club. We may be reading something together. We may just have a discussion. So I'll talk with Melanie about like the best way to to use that time. But we're going to push it to the week after U.S. Thanksgiving, which makes it November 29th when normally it would have been the 22nd. So um but thank you so much, Melanie, for your time. And thanks everybody for joining. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you.